involvement of teachers and school leaders, and then you can set the right incentives, both in terms of career and in terms of payment. Well, of course, an overview of the reforms that we face is not complete without also addressing the climate change reforms. Uh, there is really no time to lose, and here we have to, uh, we have to think about the, the shortest story in human literature written by a Mexican author, Augusto Moro, and the, short, uh, the story, I will quote it, uh, I will quote it uh, completely if you don't mind, but it's the shortest story. So there we go. When he awake, the dinosaur was still there. And that was the story. <laughs> In this story, I use this story sometimes to, to um, alert the audience about the fact that we can speak about a lot of crisis response, a lot of reforms, but then we have to realize that this climate change is ongoing, and when we awake, it will still be there, and we will have to address it. It is the single most important challenge for reform. And there is no way to postpone the urgency of these reforms. How to do that? We already discussed it a little bit, Professor. And we have to say that emission costs should have an economic price. There is no other way. And then talking about these instruments, in OECD we assess the impact of some instruments and what works and what doesn't work. We have clear evidence that taxes work better than subsidies. Why? Because subsidies um, tend to lock in the present and to, um, <coughs> to exclude new innovations. And if they are successful subsidies, then they will cost too much. So tax the bad ones, don't, do not subsidize the good ones, but tax the bad ones, and then the good behavior will come from that pricing. Trading schemes also can help to keep economies flexible, but cannot be the one and only answer because then the economic markets will, like tax havens, will go there where uh, there is the lowest price. So trading schemes can help, to keep econom economies flexible, but cannot be the one and only answer. There is also a lot to do about green growth. This is a way to reconcile ecology and economy in a way that both are, are uh, dealt with, are both are uh, uh, um, developing in a positive way. And this green growth strategy was mandated to OECD in 09, and we will deliver it in 011, also with a strong participation from countries like Korea, Australia, uh, United States, Europe, etc. So they will all participate in this project of green growth. And we think here that a combination of, um, of taxes, innovation, education, uh, markets, investment programs, good governance, etc., can really bring us a good program for green growth. And here also international coordination is imperative because without that, uh, the reforms will not stick. So some reforms need really this international coordination. Uh, last but not least, on a broader scale, we see that global imbalances should be addressed. If we do not include global imbalances in our international agenda, then we never will succeed in having global solutions. And the developing countries will ask for it, but they have good reason. The GDP per capita compared to the 15 best performing OECD countries is that it is in India like seven and in China 14%. This means that uh, the GDP per capita in these OECD countries is 14 times higher than China, than uh, India and seven times higher than uh, China, more or less. Um, we also uh, see that these countries are highly exposed to world market uh, volatilities in, in, in food prices. We almost forgot about this food crisis in 08, but this is part of the global imbalances. 
We see that in countries like India, 85% of the employment is informal, and we did not count agriculture. So almost the whole economy is informal. So this brings a lot about the global imbalances. Uh, and in China, we see that uh, we see the same, a lot of informal employment, but we see also there uh, very complex rural land use rights. We see low infrastructure. In Indonesia, we see a very low cre credit to the private sector. And all this uh, is just to illustrate that aid remains essential, but it should come also with some coordinated efforts to get better regulations, to get more open markets, to get more open economies, so that foreign direct investment could come in. These countries, this developing world, have also some very positive signs. Um, I didn't know, but in the preparation for my, my trip to, to Australia, I learned that the poverty headcount in China in the last 10 years has gone down from 85% to 36%. It's unbelievable. This is the standard of $2 a day, the UN standard, but it went down that quickly. In more or less the same time, the life expectancy in Indonesia uh, went up with uh, maybe some, something like, like, like 15%, huh? nine years from 62 to 71. The secondary school uh, attainment by um, per generation in the 55, 64 generation in these, in these developing countries, it is like one quarter of the population that had the secondary school. But now in the younger generation, it is over 50%. Isn't that massive? If, it, if an economy has over 50% and has doubled the number of people in secondary school. So China, India, and Indonesia are important trade partners, but are also very important, well, will be in the future, because they will grow so much and they will develop so fastly. Japan and Korea together have, uh, have a GDP of uh, 6 billion. China, India, and Indonesia almost have the same GDP, but 15 times more people. So will this grow in the direction of also 15 times more GDP? We don't know. But Korea, what we do know is that Korea 20 years ago was one of these developing countries. Very interesting to see, and this has a lot to do also with the future, and the future of reforms and the future of potential for a country like Australia. We have, so we have a lot of common interest areas in the international agenda. This is not only the security, of course, but also the issues that we mentioned in the, in the slides that we discussed. And I have to close this slide with, the, with the, the fir a firm pledge for the fact that new global realities also request new global institutions. We cannot stick to the same institutions and just say, well, India or Indonesia, and you know we have these nice institutions in this Western world, you're welcome to join us. Huh? This is not the way to build, to respond to these new global realities. So we have a lot of reforms to make. And we spoke about this book, Making Reform Happen. This book uh, contains a lot of chapters in the different areas and in per area, like education or pension or public administration, we brought together the lessons. But there are also some general lessons, and I will go quickly through, it, uh, through them. Use the economic and political cycles. We know that an economic upswing is the best time to introduce labor market reforms. Why? because the uncertainty that comes with the reforms is then um, balanced out by the fact that people will have more opportunities from year one to year two. Secondly, uh, the political cycles use them, use the momentum that there is a new government to introduce or to, uh, um, or to, to do reforms when uh, governments only announce reforms in, their, uh, in the year just before their elections, they will not have the, re the, the possibility to implement them. Another lesson is that uh, reforms are only successful if you get your case right, including solid evidence. If you don't have sol solid evidence, then you will be beaten by others who will, will question the evidence on which your, your um, proposals are based. And even if this questioning is very false or very mean, it will not be recognized like that in the media, 
But what will be recognized is that the government has overlooked something or that the government doesn't have a solid response. And no government will escape with the argument that its opponents are mean. A third lesson is that we have to communicate consistently, consistently and if there is, a, is, is, if there is a, an inconsistency in our communication, in our plans, then we will, we will pay the price and we will, never, we will never succeed in doing that reform. So this is think about uh, reforms before you proclaim them and pro proclaim them in more or less general objectives so that you have the flexibility to adjust your instruments. I myself made the mistake from time to time well, maybe two or three times, and then I uh, had learned from my, uh, from my experience. But I made the mistake that sometimes I proclaimed the reform as an instrument, as an instrumental reform. So I said we have to change this or that uh, mechanism to, um, to assess disability or something like that. Uh, if you announce it like that, then you are very vulnerable because that instrument may not be the just instrument, or you may, may to have a just instrument. It's much better to have your communication in the goals of the reform, and then you remain flexible in your instruments. You also have to monitor the process from day one, and that is because during the time you will introduce reform, some things, some context will change. Some opponents will become more powerful or less powerful, some changes will be there in the international economy or in the labor market or, or whatever. And then, if you don't monitor the results of your reform from day one, the case may um, fade out, may fade away, may vanish. But if you say, well, we have done this reform because we wanted to reach this, and we see from our monitoring that we have indeed some results in this area, then you can continue from there. Another lesson is that reforms are sticky if you have, if you have the right institutions at, uh, at place to make the case for the reform or even the consensus for the reform. And here in Australia you have strong instruments. I'm, I have to apologize that in my presentation I didn't take uh, sufficiently into account the evidence from New Zealand. Uh, I hope that the audience will help me to bring that in. Uh, in so far, it's helpful also to get a complete picture. But here, the institutes in Australia, like the Productivity Commission or the COAC, as a mechanism to create consensus or to create the case for reform, is, uh, has proven to be very powerful. On the other hand, your institutions do not include the business society. And there are countries who have institutions that include business and unions, and therefore can make more solid reforms in the areas and to, to, well, to build in the support and the involvement of business from day one. Uh, another uh, um, lesson is that uh, the more you engage with your opponents beforehand, the more successful the implementation of the reform will be. And of course this is difficult because engaging with the opponents um, requests a very clear distinction between the way how you build consensus and the part where you nego ne negotiate about the compensations of, lose, of losses, etc. 